Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Journal Club with Vestibular First. We're very excited to have yet another excellent guest tonight. It is Jennifer Stuskus, physical therapist and vestibular rehab and virtual reality extraordinaire. Uh, I'm going to let her further introduce herself. Yeah, thanks, Helena. It's great to be here. Um, so I am, uh, yeah, I'm a vestibular therapist. I love all things vestibular rehab. I love all things rehab technology. Um, I've been in outpatient clinical practice for over a decade. Um, I have a clinical practice here. I live in Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm the director of clinical affairs for Virtualis, which is a virtual reality company that does uh, therapeutic virtual reality and force plate technologies. I do a lot of teaching at different academic programs. Um, and I always have to give a plug for our APTA New Jersey vestibular special interest group. I'm the co-chair of that. Um, so, and we had Helena at our last, uh, and we had vestibular first come to our last um, in-person course. We had a great course. And so I'm really happy and excited to be here supporting you tonight. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll ask right off the bat, because people ask me all the time, now, yeah. we know that if you're a part of the American Physical Therapy Association, you can join the neurologic subsection, which has a special interest group in vestibular care. If you wanted uh, to join the New Jersey subsection, what are the expectations or requirements, if anything? That is a great question that I have never been asked before. <laughs> um, so in order to be part of a state APTA chapter. So in order to be part of the APTA New Jersey vestibular special interest group, you must be an APTA New Jersey member, which mm -hmm. means in addition to your APTA membership, your neurologic, I mean, actually, you don't even have to necessarily have the neurologic section, but you can be an APTA member and APTA New Jersey member. Mm -hmm. So I think the New Jersey chapter is a subsection of your APTA membership. But that said, look for us on Facebook. Uh, we have an APTA NJ Vestibular SIG Facebook group. It's a little community. We do, um, we, we post our, all of our webinars and different events that are happening. And those events are open to anyone, anyone at all. Um, and many states do approve APTA uh, credited courses. Uh, they approve those for your state. So in New Jersey, we're pre-approved for New York. We have some approval for Pennsylvania, Delaware, Connecticut, things like that. Um, look in your look in your practice act and see what's approved by what whatever. But uh, join our Facebook group. Um, that's my little plug for our APTA New Jersey Vestibular Special Interest Group. Yes, and I did that because um, not just because I know it's very important to you, although I care about that, but also because I think people sometimes don't realize that our resource is available to them at you know a very affordable or sometimes free, uh, like this journal club, cost yeah. to further your vestibular education and your connection to what I'll call the prof vestibular professional community. So I always want to be sharing about those resources. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And um, I, I was just telling you, I'll tell the world, the YouTube world, um, our APTA New Jersey does many, many, many webinars. I just hopped off a webinar uh, just now to come here. So uh, those are very affordable and you can sit in any place in the world, attend that webinar synchronously at the same time and get live CEU credits if you're in attendance synchronously. Um, and our state chapter is working with our national vestibular SIG to, to do some more programming education like that. So join our Facebook group, join the APTA, uh, uh, the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy, uh, vestibular special interest group on the national level, if you love all things vestibular. For sure, or you want to get into it, absolutely. Or you want to get into it. <laughs> Don't be scared. Don't things. be scared. <laughs> get into it. All right. So speaking of getting into it, we have a wonderful article to discuss tonight um, and some excellent clinical pearls. So uh, we are going to get to that. So virtual reality and vestibular rehab is our topic. Uh, the article that we've chosen, you can see the title below there by Heffernan et al. in 2021. It was published. And I always like to just kind of open up these talks with just a super touch light on the vestibular system because it is front and center in all of our discussions. Um, and the article does a nice job of actually kind of 
I quoted them directly here. The vestibular system consists of our sensory organs. So the vestibular apparatus, you'll see that blue kind of snail is the hearing structure and then our three canals there and some sensing organs inside the center there are located um, kind of in the right side of that picture, plus our cortical, our brain, and subcortical kind of subbrain, if you will, midbrain, cerebellum, all those structures in there that contribute to balance uh, working as a team with our body sense and our vision, right? So, um, and I want to jump in to <laughs> yes. say, I, I know we're talking about this specific meta-analysis, systematic review and meta-analysis. You and I had gone back and forth. I know you're going to bring up some other articles. There, there was another systematic review in 2020, or maybe yes. it was also 2021. Um, and I think they both do a really nice job, uh, like you said, to really talk about the vestibular system and also we're going to talk about vestibular rehab. They give really nice uh, backgrounds on what vestibular rehab is and some of the classifications and categories as we get into that. For sure, for sure. So the article in uh, this particular talk is listed um, on our website on the events page for this event. Uh, so you can access that article and read it at your leisure. Uh, in the meantime, again, we'll see that vestibular system living inside our inner ear. Just to remind everyone where it is. Uh, we do have one on the left and one on the right. So when we talk about the peripheral vestibular system, that's what we're talking about, the, the structure that lives within our inner ear. And there are many things, unfortunately, that can go wrong <laughs> with said system. Uh, and this article really focuses on the peripheral issues um, as far as how we can apply treatment uh, with virtual reality. So. Um, specifically, they definitely focus on what we'll call unilateral vestibular hypofunction. Um, there are some other issues that can come up, as you see, like BPPV, our old favorite, this crystals going out of place in our inner ear, and so forth. So you see kind of some examples of damage to the uh, peripheral system. Most of those result in a unilateral hypofunction. Everything below BPPV, essentially on this list, um, results in a similar uh, set of issues, we'll say. Central, just to contrast, that's the brain, um, and uh, I guess you could say the, the, the brain stem as well, so kind of that, those structures there and all the potential problems, which are many and varied, as far as processing motion, where are we in space, um, you know, different uh, sorts of pathology, including persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which there is a nice article that I kind of briefly mention at the end of this talk which does apply the use of virtual reality for that group. And uh, just to remind everyone what that is, it is when, I call it the brain learns dizziness, but it's really more complicated than that. Um, usually there's some sort of initial event, um, although it's not always clear what that was, say an episode of BPPV, for example, um, and after that a person might kind of have some, essentially what we'll call brain um, restructuring, some kind of functional uh, pathways to get created so the person might feel constantly off balance um, or dizzy or disequilibrium. There's lots of terms <laughs> um, for this condition. So because it kind of is an issue at the brain level, I put it under central vestibular pathology, um, even though it's not something that we can see with the traditional MRI of the head, for example, just to be clear. All right, so now we get into the good stuff. So I know you're excited about this slide. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk about what a clinical practice guideline is. It is where a group of folks try to get together and look through literature and say what's best practice how, uh, based on current literature to treat a given condition, in this case, unilateral vestibular hypofunction. Um, so why don't you just kind of touch on this since you were literally just in a webinar about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the first thing to talk about is one of these early uh, systematic reviews, this Cochrane review that really says vestibular rehab is effective, right? We, we know that what we do is effective. So the clinical practice guidelines that came out in 2016 spoke to the types of exercises and a little bit on the dosage of how we prescribe these uh, specific exercises for vestibular rehab, the gaze stability exercises, the posture control and balance retraining, uh, perceptual reorientation or habituation exercises, and then walking programs and endurance training. Uh, the updated practice guideline that just was released in 20, well, I guess technically 2022, it came out, it was published in January um, of this last year, adds additional information about 
prescribing the dosage for gaze stabilization. It gives some additional dosage for balance. Um, and I think on your next slide, you're going to say uh, some of the new guidelines actually do specifically talk about using low technologies and high technologies like virtual reality in our prescription, uh, specifically as it relates to balance retraining. Exactly. And I think what I want to emphasize here is essentially sometimes it's a thought, I think, by various clinicians um, and patients that if the patient in question with a vestibular issue, say a hypofunction, just moves their head around here and there, that that will resolve um, all issues. And although I am definitely a proponent of head movement over no head movement, <laughs> um, you know, the guidelines are really designed to provide um, kind of like a basic set of standards of like why speed of your head can matter over time and you would want to kind of emphasize some things around that and why you would want to be integrating the use of the balance system while being able to turn the head. So, you know, something as simple as walking and turning your head, which is a functional uh, activity, so I can look for traffic when I'm going to cross the street, um, but also kind of ways that we can approach, you know, kind of training and providing, you know, cues to say, well, we're going to kind of you know, pace yourself at first, and then we'll try to increase the speed later and feel where your feet are, these kind of ability to really, that's what vestibular rehab is. It's not just oh, I could do this at home by myself and just move my head around randomly. Well, you might get somewhat better. You might get a lot better if you're lucky. But most folks, um, based on the literature, as you can see presented right here, do better when we're able to follow some more specifics. It's still going to be tailored to the individual. That should always be the case with therapy. Uh, but the guidelines are, are, you know, they're not strict rules. It says guidelines. It's, you know, to provide you a basic framework, um, which was, should increase your chance of success. Is that a good summary, do you think? Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you and I have been doing vestibular rehab for quite a while. In our lifetime, in our clinical lifetime, these practice guidelines have really evolved and adapted. Vestibular rehab is not that old of, you know, a rehabilitation technique, right? So the people who really started vestibular rehabilitation, Dr. Susan Herdman uh, specifically, was a huge driving force in the really early research studies that said gaze stabilization, you cannot turn the head, uh, you cannot uh, improve someone's ability to see clearly if you're not turning their head. Uh, we cannot train the vestibular system without those head turns, but um, yeah, the gaze stabilization, postural control and balance retraining habituation of disorientation and then a walking program and exercise for endurance, those are, are kind of new codified structures in the clinical practice guidelines. Um, it's really exciting that they're coming out. One of the things that they make very clear in the clinical practice guideline is that there's not that many high level articles, randomized control trials, systematic reviews, uh, these types of things that we're looking at there's really not that many of them. Um, and in the past five years from the 2016 to this most recent one published in 2022, um, they, even the last year, they, they do the review and then they update the review like just before they're ready to publish so that they don't miss anything that's recent. There were like 20 new articles that had come out just in that last year of the five year review period. Um, so that's all to say that um, yeah, these things are, are really based on expert opinion. The people who did the research are helping to develop these, but now we have many, many, many more research articles to create this clinical practice guideline, and the research is coming out really, really quickly um, to help us prescribe and dose vestibular rehabilitation exercises. Right, and this is where this kind of statement comes into play, this kind of idea of customized exercises are more effective than generic. So the idea that, you know, the person who says I get dizzy in the grocery store, that at some point, maybe not the first day, <laughs> you might try a, you know, simulation, whether it be um, you have enough room in your clinic to set up a nice aisle, good job <laughs> for you, um, with some actual cans on a shelf or something, or, um, you know, virtual reality, which is certainly... Uh, portable and flexible in ways that um, your physical space sometimes cannot be. So, you know, just kind of putting that in the context of this talk um, and, you know, just nice to see some literature coming out as you see quoted here 
um, that you know we know that the dizziness handicap inventory, which we'll talk about more shortly, is a measure of you know how dizzy a person feels with different activities, essentially, and that we can make what we would call objective improvements in a patient's um, symptoms, you know, with this kind of training. So. Um, Another thing to consider as we look at this bouncing eye, which is so attractive to the eye. <laughs> so those who are sensitive to visual motion might not like this slide. Um, <laughs> but we know that uh, the article mentions that 73% of patients with vestibular disease report more enjoyment and motivation um, using virtual reality and augmented reality. We'll talk about the difference shortly. But um, you know, it's nice to know that one of the things that we want to look at with customization is you know, is the person going to do their homework? Are they going to do some activity? Or even in clinic, are they going to be willing to do what you're asking them to do? Um, and any clinician who's had a bit of experience is going to know that there's, you know, definitely some resistance sometimes um, to moving the head because it stimulates symptoms that are a bit unpleasant to the patient. So, you know, having it be fun and have it that fun actually kind of make them be like, oh, I didn't even feel dizzy because I was so, uh, you know, distracted. You just got to trick them into it by <laughs> making it more fun, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, yes. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, and actually, I think this systematic review and meta-analysis really does, uh, I was rereading it tonight just before we came on, and it was really interesting that the outcomes that they were looking at in this review focused on patient report, right? So I know we're going to talk about things like the DHI, the ABC, the motion sensitivity quotient, the um, situational... Uh, vertigo questionnaire. Those are really patient reports of how well the patient feels like they're doing in rehab because we've all had patients where, oh, their FGA is better and their you know, other balance you know, assessments, they can do a cat sit, they can do the sensory organization test, but they're still symptomatic. And if they're still symptomatic, um, they're, you know, they're still not perceiving, they may not be perceiving that they're improving with vestibular rehab. So I, I really like the, this systematic review looked at some of those patient reported measures as the way to, to really define if virtual reality. So they really focus on that customization, the motivational aspects, the fun aspects right. um, of virtual reality. Absolutely. I mean, it's very equivalent in my head to a perhaps more accessible experience for folks sometimes, which is pain versus strength. So a person is in rehabilitation, they're getting stronger and stronger, you, you feel like they're moving better, but they still feel pain. And so, you know, we care about that pain and we care about that dizziness. And so being able to kind of address that as a piece of the puzzle, and that's all nerves in my book and learning and remapping and all kinds of fun things that's happening uh, at a molecular level. It's so cool, but you know, it's, it's very complicated in the sense that it's, again, individualized um, because there are many factors that come into play there as far as everything from our age to you know, our um, kind of past learning experiences and all of these things that that come into a, you know, a, a process of change. So virtual reality in this article is defined as the immersion of the user in an interactive environment that mimics reality. Um, and of course, we're well aware that there are many non-immersive commercially available video gaming systems, uh, which anyone with a uh, child of the age of 10 and above is probably very familiar with, um, such as a Wii Fit or an Oculus, et cetera. And they excluded those from the systematic review uh, because it, it's really um, clear that those are just so diverse. And so to be able to kind of quantify that input and say that that was done in a certain way is, I think, in some ways more difficult. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the biggest, uh, I do a lot of teaching on virtual reality. Obviously for Virtualis, we're educating customers on how to use the Virtualis product. Um, and I always start the discussion, I always start the education asking people about their experience using virtual reality. And everyone thinks about the head mounted display systems. Of course, that's what we're talking about uh, tonight because this article specifically excludes the two-dimensional, the semi-immersive, uh, the, the TV screen types of virtual reality systems. Um, but I always say, if you've never used, you know, if you've ever used the Wii, the Wii Fit with a patient, you've used virtual reality with a patient. It's just a different type. Um, and one of the biggest um, limitations of the literature is that many studies do not um, specify 
the level of immersion and the type of virtual reality that was used in, in the research. So I read a lot of literature on virtual reality, um, different systems, different types of uh, virtual reality. And there's some really early studies back in the 90s and maybe even earlier that ex just, just specifically are looking at the Wii or they're just specifically looking at gaming or gamification, um, which is different than fully immersive virtual reality systems. Absolutely. And something that my husband often points out is, you know, the challenges of technology and being attached to like, say, oh, that we'll just only ever study the Wii. Well, what if the company making the Wii stops making the Wii or they change it to the point where it's quite different in what we'll call specifications, you know, things like frame rate, the speed of how fast the video is going or, you know, what kind of targets there are and all these variables um, that then make it really difficult to, you know, quantify and translate that into a different system that's not a Wii, for example. And so, you know, um, the, the nice thing about having <laughs> systems out there at some point that are uh, somewhat standardized, we'll say, and perhaps able to be a bit more consistent to establish their own research base, you know, within that system, you know, at least we can do apples to apples a little better. Um, because otherwise it's definitely more difficult to show, okay, yes, if we do it just like the study did, but with our Google Cardboard, we'll have the same results. It's kind of difficult to translate that out. Yeah, we'll have that, definitely have that conversation <laughs> later on tonight. Yes, for sure. All right, so um, in this study, or this systematic review, if you will, um, they talked about how immersive VR treats vestibular dysfunction, placing the subject in a simulated real world through two different strategies. One is uh, a system that uses a head-mounted display, and the other would be what they call total body immersion, uh, which would need to be done in a clinic. You're not building this in your house, probably, <laughs> unless you're very rich. Um, and they give an example uh, of a system, which I have in the picture here, where the person is kind of pictured on the screen, I suppose. Um, and uh, we'll have more pictures of different yeah. examples. And that's, and that's something also similar to like the Xbox Connect where you see a representation of yourself on the image of the TV and you're looking at yourself being immersed in that environment. Exactly. And then in contrast or in comparison, if you will, augmented reality is still giving you some sense of the real world. Um, so anyone who's played Pokemon Go and <laughs> taken a picture. I was gonna say that's, that's always the, <laughs> the go-to example I talk about for augmented reality. For sure, then you see a character uh, on your street. Um, so you're seeing your own street because uh, it is using your camera on your smartphone typically and then kind of imposing this uh, cartoon image in that case. Um, so it's a bit different in that it's kind of not immersive in the same way, I would say, um, but it does try to tie in like the real world environment. So, you know, I suppose pros and cons there. And they have one of the five studies in this uh, Systematic Review does kind of talk a little bit about the use of augmented reality. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I have to give a plug. Augmented reality is something, um, so, you know, right now we use our, our cell phone as, or like an iPad or something to, to look through to see the augmentation of the reality. That's a more of a two-dimensional, not immersive, even though it's in the real world, you're still focused through a device. Um, I'm really excited for some of the head-mounted display virtual reality systems to also um, have the ability to go into the augmented reality space. I think um, I, I think we are seeing some studies coming out now, and so hopefully in the coming years we'll see more of that, because that's really important to be in uh, a realistic environment, and the real world is the most realistic environment, of course, but if you're looking through something small, you're not actually engaged with the the periphery of the real world. Absolutely. All right, so the objectives of the systematic review are listed here as such. They wanted to look at the benefits uh, of this kind of treatment uh, for those with peripheral vestibular disorders within three months of treatment. Uh, and then they also looked, uh, there was one of the five studies that looked at long-term uh, benefits at 12 months, I believe it was. And um, looking at any, you know, kind of adverse or negative si uh, side effects, they call them later, um, of using this intervention and kind of looking at adherence or people who did complete treatment versus not. 
So after finding many, many studies, as all these systematic reviews seem to do, and then having their very nice uh, defined criteria, they narrowed it down to five randomized controlled yeah. uh, trials um, for this review. Um, so I'm trusting that section. I am not the data slash statistics ex expert there. So I, I believe based on all the fancy words they use that it was a well done systematic review and hopefully someone who is out there in the data world could confirm that for me. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, it's like very similar to the peripheral vestibular hypofunction clinical practice guidelines we were talking about at the beginning, where, you know, sometimes there's just not that much research, but you have to pull it together and, and talk about it in order to perpetuate new research to say, this is what we found in this one specific PICO question. And hopefully more articles are provided that answer this question. Um, so I think it's, it's really interesting. And, and actually, I think another reason why this specific systematic review did a meta-analysis in order to make sure that these five studies were representative of everything that's out there, and then specifically using, you know, head-mounted display, right? So these are, these are actually head-mounted display and that um, uh, augmented reality environment, right? So these studies are really focused in on a specific type of modality that is used to provide virtual reality intervention. Definitely. Yep. So as you said, they pulled five studies total, two of which used the head mounted display, two used uh, the, uh, what they call that kind of in-clinic device, something like what's pictured here, um, that is a Burtek. Uh, down in the right lower hand corner, and then the fifth study was uh, using augmented reality. So they talked about side effects in this study, and that's kind of the idea that some people, whether they're gamers or <laughs> people with vestibular issues, maybe trying to use a uh, virtual reality system for treatment, uh, might experience kind of motion sickness, nausea, uh, that sort of thing. And essentially, you know, there was some experience of that, but it did decrease over time as I presume they, their brain adapted to that kind of sensory environment. Um, and uh, kind of by the fourth week, they uh, seemed to be well managed in the group overall. So if you could speak to any personal experience on treating patients um, who maybe have dealt with this or kind of any tips of the trade to reduce it or kind of make it go away faster, or what do you think? Yeah, so I think the first thing to talk about here is that we're talking specifically about vestibular rehab and individuals who have vestibular dysfunction tend to have more motion sickness, right? We talked, we already talked about, you have to move your head in order to stimulate the vestibular system. If you don't move it, you'll lose it. You'll you lose the ability. You don't like to do that. So it doesn't feel good to do it. Um, so self motion, self motion, motion sickness. There's also people with vestibular disorders have visual environment, motion sensitivities, and virtual reality, one of the main sensory motor systems that we're stimulating with virtual reality is the visual system. So uh, when we have a population who has self motion and visual environment motion sensitivities, we're asking them to look at a very rich visual environment and oftentimes turn their head in that visual environment. We have, we're, we're actually trying to target training them through habituation of reorienting them to those environments. Uh, so one of the things to consider when we're looking at virtual reality and, and you've already defined virtual reality I think it's also important to define, we talked a little bit about the different types of immersion. Um, virtual reality is hardware and software. So specifically, we're gonna really focus on the head mounted display type of hardware. The other consideration is that visual environment, which is the software. And individuals who are already visually motion sensitive uh, they're already, they may be having visual and vestibular sensory mismatch, could be very easily over, overly stimulated in a very bright, colorful, rich environment. Um, so not just the hardware, but also the software is a consideration when we say patients do have symptoms. Certain software, certain games, you cannot adjust them. They're a game, like the Oculus, you put a, the headset on, you play a game, 
you're moving at a certain speed and there's no adjustment to that because it's not um, an intervention, it's a game. The we, right? You're in the we environment and you're moving your body, you're, you're interacting with the TV screen, but uh, oftentimes the patient is not adjusting the color, the brightness, the sound, the speed of movement that's happening in that we environment. These articles, this article did not look at, uh, the systematic review did not look at any articles that had uh, customizable virtual reality softwares, which is a consideration when we're looking at patients who are very sensitive to these environments. Um, so one of the biggest, and you know, another limitation in the virtual reality, generally in the virtual reality literature, is that we don't have a good way to determine who is appropriate where do we start the level of intensity of the visual environment of the virtual world? How much color, how much movement, how many things in the, how complex is the environment? Uh, we don't really have a good outcome measure to assess for that before we put people in. So it's a, it's a big variable, it's a big variable um, when patients are saying they're getting virtual reality sickness. Part of that is the hardware. Part of that is the software. You already mentioned the frame rate. So how quickly the visual environment is getting into the hardware and being processed in the brain at the same time, hopefully it's, it's at the same time as the head is moving. Because if you already have a visual and vestibular mismatch or a vestibular and, and somatosensory proprioceptive mismatch, it's only going to drive more of a mismatch and make people feel more sick. So that, that frame rate is part of the, the hardware and making sure that that signal is getting into the, the, the headset at, at the correct time or at the same time. Um, individuals can get motion sick. They can get environmentally motion sick, that the visual environmental sickness in virtual reality systems if the therapist is not prescribing the right environment at the right speed of motion for the right duration of time. And you usually start, at least like traditional rehab, how I approach it, what I'll call light. So like, we're going to do a real simple environment. We're going to do it for one minute. We're going to do like a basic, you know, Absolutely. paintbrush on the, you know, each side to paint two different paintings or something. And then if they do well with that, I don't know, what's your symptom level? And then you adjust. And that's where that customization comes in. Is that an accurate kind of description? Yeah, that's so that's part of the customization. The part of the customization is knowing the environment. Um, and some of the, the things that I educate uh, people about when they use virtual reality is being able to first identify your patient's symptoms, right? What kind of symptoms do they have and quantifying the baseline for their symptoms. Then we want to think about the internet. Like, what do we want them to do? Do we want them to be exposed to an environment? Do we want them to just work on head turning? Do we want them to be doing gaze stabilization? Do we want them to be doing postural control and balance and sensory reweighting? Like, which intervention are we really trying to target? Um, which category are we trying to target? And then, how? What type of an intervention do we want to do? And that will help us identify the environment. Are we having them move around a lot? Well, okay, we start with a, a more plain environment or a simpler cognitive task. If we want them to be, uh, you know, to, to habituate to just the visual motion, well, then we need to have something more dynamic, right? So we start simple and we move to complex. We start plain, we move to complex. We start static, we move to dynamic. Um, and you mentioned duration, always short duration, right? So seconds at a time, 10 seconds, 30 seconds might be where we start, but you first have to be able to quantify the baseline. And then just like anything else that we do in vestibular rehab or orthopedic rehab, when we talk about pain management, um, we dose, we find their base, we start with the baseline, and then we dose whatever we're doing to their tolerance, starting with uh, short duration, probably short duration, um, maybe slow or slow progression. 
And then we want them to make sure that like we want to, they should be supported. They should be seated versus standing versus whatever based on our baseline of their balance performance. So we should be at a two out of 10 dizziness starting out. For example, we're not going to go to more than a four out of 10. If you're hitting a five, let me know. I'm going to kind of have you take a break or back off. Is that kind of a good like description or absolutely. Example? And, and because virtual reality is so fun and it's motivating and they don't remember where they, they don't remember they're in the real world. They're not focused on their symptoms. The therapist should also be using that stopwatch to make sure we're watching the clock. Um, our software has a clock timer for all of our softwares because the therapist also should be using that to check in with their patient to say, hey, oh, it's been 30 seconds. Oh, hey, how are you feeling? Because um, when our patients are doing something that they're really enjoying, they may not think about their symptoms. They may push themselves over the edge without even recognizing it. Right. Um, so dosing to tolerance is yes, talk to the patient, ask them, but also making sure that you are looking at those short duration periods. Hey, how are you feeling now? Do you, are you, what number are you? Um, we certainly don't want to make our patients over, um, overly conscious, conscious about their symptoms, right? We don't want them to be symptom fixated. <laughs> Yes. But uh, yeah, so so the patient should be aware, but the therapist also looking at those short durations, short doses. Perfect. And it's always, always better to under prescribe at least within the first, you know, few sessions until you understand your patient's tolerance, because just like this, uh, the, the previous slide said, said, some people do have uh, sensitivity, they get symptomatic. And we know if we make our patients symptom, uh, if we make our patients symptomatic, they're less likely to return. If they don't return, they don't have as as good of outcomes. They're probably not doing something at home if they didn't want to come into the clinic to do it. Absolutely. All right. So uh, another aspect that's discussed in this article and is good to consider is adherence and visits to improvement. So. Um, they kind of made this mathematical equation to say on kind of what I'll call average, the overall adherence was 98.4% over the four to six week study period. So on the one hand, it's nice because it's not super long. The longer your study or your treatment application is, you do have, you know, some risk of losing people over time because they got sick or whatever. But in addition to that, we certainly could say, um, and I apologize that I did not take the time to find a study to do kind of what traditional rehab if what the adherence is but I would say my personal experience does not resonate with 98.4 percent so I'm going to say it's lower <laughs> um, and uh, as far as the augmented reality they did not get that information exactly but they did say that there was improvement over four visits uh, versus six visits without the augmented reality so um, that's certainly promising we'll put it that way yeah, and I think the other thing to, to, to remember, and we keep talking about virtual reality is motivating, it's fun, it's a, you know, people like it. They want to come back into the clinic. They, you know, that's a, for us as treating clinicians. They want to come back to do the research. They want to be involved in the research study. I think that's one of the reasons they had such good um, compliance because they liked the research that they were involved in, right? That's another reason that people drop out of research studies is that like, they just don't feel like it's really doing anything for them, right? Um, so I think that's, yeah, I think it's a good point to, to make. Cool. All right, so just to get everybody on the same page about that dizziness handicap inventory that we've referenced a few times, it is an outcome measure. Um, I call it functional because dizziness and how the patient's feeling matters. Um, even though it's not a balance measure, which is maybe more of a physical functional outcome. Um, and it has 25 questions. For those who are not familiar, you score a yes, sometimes, or no to each of these characteristics. It just gives a couple examples listed here about kind of what specific types of activities or movements, um, you know, kind of affect the dizziness, how are they feeling about it, et cetera. So it's a very well-validated outcome measure. And I will say, yeah. um, I did not mention it earlier, I am a member of the Vestibular Edge Task Force, which is the, I never remember what EDGE stands for, <laughs> uh, effectiveness database to guide, uh, the evidence database to guide effectiveness. I don't know. Something um, like that. <laughs> but, but we do, we did classify the dizziness handicap inventory. If you know the ICF model, 
we have our diagnosis or our health condition, our impairments and activity limitations and participation restrictions, and then internal and external factors. Um, on the ICF model, the, the dizziness handicap inventory is categorized as a participation restriction measure. Yeah, so it's functional as it relates to our patients being able to or not being able to participate in their daily life roles. Absolutely. And there are other great outcome measures. I'm not going to dig into outcome measures in this particular talk, just to be clear. Um, and mm -hmm. several were used in the different studies. Um, so yeah. feel free to read about those on the, your own or watch the journal club that we did with Sue Whitney back in February of 2022, in which we ended up talking quite a bit about outcome measures. So uh, you can get your fill there. Uh, but yeah. just know that the DHI does not fit every case. Um, so, you know, it's not like all vestibular patients in my clinic automatically get a DHI, but it is certainly applies to the majority um, and unilateral of vestibular hypofunction, I would say almost always. So uh, that's why it's a great measure for what they were trying to look at. Um, so in conclusion here, as far as the results for this particular systematic review, they did find an improvement in the DHI for patients using virtual reality or augmented reality compared to those who had traditional vestibular rehab, but just still moving your head around, still doing VOR or gaze stability exercises, et cetera. So there's definitely just the addition. And that's what I like about those studies is that they really, it wasn't like, oh, you're just going to lay around in bed or you're going to do virtual reality, which is not a great study, just to be clear. Um, so I was happy to see that. And um, they did feel like, um, you know, there was a, a positive effect. So, you know, we want to, as you said, see more studies. Um, and now we're going to talk about some recommendations based on what literature we do have and your clinical pearls towards the end here are coming up. So um, there was a study that pulled out a number of at least 150 minutes of cumulative exposure. So not in one day, uh, <laughs> but over the course of call it four to six weeks is this example um, in the systematic review has, um, you know, to kind of uh, build up enough input to make changes, right? And this is true of almost any rehabilitation, whether it's to gain strength or to reduce dizziness symptoms. We need time and repetition usually of certain movements and things to get the brain to make changes in this case. Um, so, and I like to always give my pro tip because sometimes I'll have a new clinician will say, oh, we'll just have them shake their head all day. And I'm like, no, <laughs> the brain does not like to be pushed in that way. <laughs> um, so more is not always better in that sense. It can be a bit of what I call Goldilocks, you know, just the right amount, fine line, however you want to phrase it. Uh, enough input to provoke a little bit of symptom to try to get the brain to do the work that it needs to do to, you know, make these changes to, you know, process movement better, we'll say. Um, but on the flip side, uh, you know, we don't want to just, you know, make somebody feel so rotten that they're rotten, you know, feeling for hours. Not only because they will not want to come to the therapy, but I don't really think the literature supports well. that you learn from that. Like, it's not really effective. So um, this is why we have clinical practice guidelines to try to help guide us as to, you know, what we should be moving towards and then always responding to patient report and kind of adjusting. Um, so as far as frequency, there was a question that came up from Danielle Vaughn, who's an excellent physical therapist, about um, cumulative and then frequency. So these um, particular studies all kind of had them at the two times per week, which is pretty traditional for most rehabilitation. So that's sure. nice. <laughs> um, and the sessions um, kind of varied in length, depending on if they were trying to do a mix of virtual reality and other traditional rehab and so forth, but essentially call it between 20 and 45 minutes, <laughs> um, depending on whether they were doing else at home or whatnot. Um, you know, so kind of some level where it's, it's more than a few minutes, but that doesn't mean you can't take breaks, right? So this cumulative, you know, number is really important, um, I think. And uh, similarly, in this uh, kind of last study, uh, I didn't cover the augmented reality one because they didn't get into much detail about frequency there. So, uh, but they all, all of these four studies um, that use the heads mounted or the kind of in clinic device all did a uh, way over the 150 minutes. So I can certainly say that they, you know, crossed that threshold easily as far as cumulative um, minutes to make change. All right. Covering that again. All right, so last but not least, we're gonna talk about system options. I wanna leave some time for this. We only have 15 minutes. It's so exciting, this topic. It's hard to cap myself. All right, so I'm gonna kind of roll through this a little bit and then get some input from you, Jen. So 
system options, there are many. I focused on ones that I am aware have vestibular rehab specific kind of software programs, etc. cetera. Um, so the Burtec is a large unit out there. That's kind of one to be an in-clinic device as well as the other two listed there. And only the ones that have asterisks on this list, to my knowledge, have FDA clearance specifically. Some may have other regulatory clearances in other countries and things, just to be clear. Um, and then as far as head-mounted devices, which is what that HMD stands for, Virtualitis, um, as well as Libra VR and Neuro Rehab VR are the ones that I was aware of. So if I missed any, I apologize. And if one's already defunct, I apologize. The, you know, the world is constantly changing with this technology, as we mentioned. That so technology, quickly. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think we talked about this. I think you've pretty much captured the ones that are really specific uh, for vestibular rehab and have some some level of therapeutic dosing, right? So different than I think what we're going to talk about on maybe the next slide, which are more of the over the counter, uh, over the counter, off the shelf um, types of systems. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so. For those systems, you know, in some ways they're similar. For example, they still might use a head-mounted device. The they hardware still... is the same. Yeah. yeah, so these kind of handheld, uh, is there a specific name for those little sticks in his hands? Yeah, we call them hand controllers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So the hand controllers so that you can do tasks in the virtual world using your arms, which is logical and uh, functional. So I found a couple quick game examples that I thought would know, be kind of, people might want to try them in clinic, mini golf, you know, table tennis, stuff that's supposed to be fun. Um, but as you pointed out, there are some challenges to not being able to kind of control this environment. It's just kind of what it is. Um, and the only thing you can probably control for sure is how long they would play it, I suppose. Yeah, and I would say these are great examples. Even like Fruit Ninja is something that you can find on most of these uh, off-the-shelf head-mounted display systems. Um, it's really important. To, we talked about the hardware and the software. So Oculus is a brand of hardware. Some softwares are free for download and some softwares like you have here have a specific cost for the software. Um, one of the softwares that you would not want to do with someone who has visual motion sensitivity is put them on a roller coaster ride while they're standing on a firm, flat, solid surface where they're getting a sensory mismatch of what's happening visually and what's happening proprioceptively. So I will say things like that should be avoided if you cannot dose out the speed, the you know, the, the color, the sound, the, the speed, all of the, um, the things in the environment that would make someone sick. And while we're talking about price, it would not be fair to talk about these and not acknowledge the price points because I realize we're going to talk about cons of these more what we'll call affordable yeah, systems sure. that, like the Oculus, is, is relatively affordable. Um, but the Burtec and and like I are in the hundreds of thousands. Am I wrong? Yeah. So anything on the top of that section or over a hundred thousand dollars, Burtec is really a commercially available system. Uh, it's a force plate technology that uses that semi-immersive, that rear projection um, uh, way to bring virtual environment. Virtualis, we have a, a, a virtual, we have a motion VR, a dynamic motion simulator, which uses the head-mounted display. We also have a standalone head-mounted display. So the amount that the more things that come, right? So that if you add a force plate right. to a headset, you add a force plate with the virtual reality projection, it's it's um, exponentially more expensive. So what's the, the range for what we'll call virtual yeah, system Yeah, I would options. say a couple, thousand, a couple thousand to a couple hundred thousand, right? Depending on other consideration um, and looking at the bottom half of the list, we'll, we'll look at those as like standalone head-mounted display systems that have therapeutic value. Um, one of the differences in the cost is going to be the amount of softwares that they offer, right? So for example, if they only offer five different softwares and they're all treatment-based, it's probably going to be a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars. If they have software for assessment and rehabilitation and you have more, you have 10 softwares now, it's probably going to be in the thousands, like mid to, to 20 so thousand. The more assessment, the more rehab, the more softwares, 
uh, the more expensive something is. Got it. All right. That's very helpful. All right. So moving through, I did notice there was an article on treating persistent postural perceptual dizziness, which I promised talk, to talk about in this context um, from Choi et al. in 2021. They talked about you know, kind of how they use the different under the sea and the night sky, um, you know, and they tried to kind of utilize that for treatment. I think it is important to note that this kind of optokinetic stimulus, the idea of adding kind of visual motion to those who have visual motion sensitivity, which is kind of a, not everyone with 3PD has that, but certainly quite a few do, um, you know, can have some value. So although I, we already discussed a lot of the limitations to using an Oculus clinically, um, and in research, frankly, but I appreciate their desire to try to kind of, you know, hit some yeah. of these uh, relevant. And, and I will say one of the most common questions that I get that, that we get in the virtual reality world is like, well, what soft, like what games should I download? I don't know. I work for a company that develops our own software, but articles like this that explicitly list modules that list games are really great resources to say, these are the games that was, these are the softwares that were used on this hardware for this patient population. These are great places to start to look at that. Right, and again, knowing that this, this may not be always available, maybe night sky goes away, but just kind of being aware that, like you say, anything that's, you know, at least done, you know, in a, in a ideally consistent way, I didn't, Dig into this. I didn't dig into this study in detail, to be frank, but you know, it, it was there, and it's something you could take a look okay. at as a clinician. Um, you know, really simple, simple, simple. We have this kind of Google Cardboard idea with a head strap. A lot of people, cause the head strap's not that great, so you're gonna might want to just hold it with your hands. I'll be honest. Um, so it's it's very inexpensive. Um, there is one app out there that was developed by a couple of physicians that I found called VR Sick Fix. Uh, which has kind of like some targets, these little floating um, objects, <laughs> little blue, yeah. uh, not a hexagon, I don't know what it is. Any, anyway, it's, uh, you know, very simple, not necessarily as engaging, to be honest, but it's free. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, it is. The software is free and the hardware is cheap. Exactly. So low bar of entry, not a lot of customizability and probably not uh, very motivating. Um, yeah. But it's it's something that if you're trying to kind of just sort it out, try things out on your own, maybe get comfortable with the idea, um, you could take a look at that. Um, and they do have course games um, mm -hmm. for Google Cardboard on the app. Some are free. Some of them you have to buy the game for a pretty nominal fee. Um, but again, no controlling this uh, sort of application. It's just kind of what it is. Um, so we're going to get to our clinical pearls with just a few minutes to spare. So first yeah. of all, <laughs> I'm going to let you talk yeah, through these we, slides. <laughs> yeah, we kind of talked about this already, right? So this is as it relates to dosing. We talked about quantifying the baseline, figuring out what you're really going to work on. Start simple, start slow, start short, maybe start seated or supported somehow holding on to something. Um, consider that surface and the position that you have your patient in and then dose your patient to tolerance, right? Using virtual reality, uh, applying virtual reality as your uh, treatment tool, as your modality is no different than any other modality that we use. I hate to compare it to e-stim or ultrasound because it is not that, um, but we're applying virtual reality and uh, it's not, the game is not playing the patient. The plate, the patient is actually doing something therapeutic. We're just happening, you know, we're just happening to use that virtual world. Absolutely. Um, so that, those are, I think we covered those. This, these next clinical pearls, um, and again, the, I always get questions about virtual reality systems. And Helena, you did a great job of mentioning different types. And of course, you have to mention costs and you have to know the pros and the cons. But number one is educating yourself on what is out there. So coming to things like this. Also talk to your friends, right? Uh, message people in those, in those professional networking communities, the Facebook groups, the online communities, go to conferences and ask people what they're using. Um, but really first identify what you need. Are you looking for virtual reality just for treatment? Are you looking at virtual reality just for assessment? Um, how, what type of treatment, how much customizability and adjustability are you looking for for your specific patient populations? A lot of these uh, therapeutic systems offer data. 
what do you want? What are you getting? What does it mean? So are you watching the data in real time? Can you change the environment in the real time and see the data change? Do you get to look at the data after? Can you compare data session to session? Things like that. Um, and then identify your options. We talked about a lot of these off the shelf, over the counter, off the shelf type systems. We talked about the app based phone kind of Google cardboard systems. Ask your colleagues, ask, you know, ask people what they're what they're using. Um, lots of conversations online about this. And then try before you buy. Absolutely. Um, certainly the the therapeutic systems that we mentioned, like Vertec and, and the Libra and Virtualis, uh, Neuro Rehab, you should be able to schedule some sort of an in-person or at least web-based demonstration and or come to a conference and, and try it out for yourself. So CSM is a big one. Everyone's always at CSM. If you're a physical therapist, that's a great place to try different technologies. Um, today is July 19th. 2022 in the fall. I don't know exactly the dates, but is it October, right? Yeah, These are mid October. A &P, yeah, ANPT, um, the, the, the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy has an annual conference in mid October. Just after that is the International Vestibular ICVR, International Conference for Vestibular Rehab. Um, that is just after that, the same location in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, those are great places to try technologies out. And just go, because if you're into vestibular, you will yeah, be I'll like loving being at the International uh, Vestibular Conference or International yeah. Conference for Vestibular Rehab, if you will. All right. So your take home message, it has a lot of potential. We need a lot more research. There was a pro tip offered in the Choi article that says to reduce provoking severe simulator sickness, avoid simulations with targets or backgrounds objects moving forward and backward is that your personal yeah. experience as well yeah forget that roller coaster forget the driving that that's like the opt the optical flow um if you cannot modulate it modify it you know dose it really if you don't have control over it don't use those games don't use those um off the off the shelf over the counter off the shelf um types of software in you know, lesser expensive hardware. They're, they're going to, they're going to be too much for your patients. Got it. All right. So we've got some resources and then we're going to get to our live questions to wrap up. So yeah, if you want to contact Jen for any reason, you're interested in her teaching a vestibular course in your area. You're interested in learning more about their uh, virtuals for whom she does work. Full disclosure, hopefully that was clear throughout the whole talk. Um, but I think we did a good job of covering the variety of options just to be clear. Um, yeah. There are ways to contact her um, through her emails listed there. Online education wise, I found a couple great resources. One, of course, the APT a New Jersey <laughs> Stipular SIG. So watch for their webinars and uh, feel free to take them. And uh, they are a very affordable cost. Uh, Neuro Collaborative did a nice uh, webinar yeah, with I you that webinar. as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really nice resource if it you're is looking free. to learn more. Yeah. It is free. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. feel free to, yeah. to watch and they're that. A great, they're a great networking group. They don't focus on vestibular. They're really neuro um, as a broader, but they're great. Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not as good on social media as I am with direct email. I like to read the message and then unread it so I can remember to reply to it. Uh, email is really the best way to get in contact, but, but follow me and I don't know, look for me online. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Jen's a great resource um, and you guys are all great. So I think we're ready to go to our questions. Yeah. So first question, Robin Evans, can you speak to using YouTube videos such as those found on the Emory Dizziness channel and Gabriel Pierce PT, my favorite, because she does have a lot of nice uh, walking through the Italian market in Philadelphia <laughs> videos that I'm partial to. Um, do you consider this training virtual reality? Um, and she also thought yeah, this, this is, is a great question. So, uh, uh, so this is a, a type of virtual reality. It is two dimensional virtual reality, right? So it's not just meant to simulate the real world. It is a video of the real world in most cases, right? Walking down the streets of New York, 
walking through the streets of Philly, the, uh, you just said the market name, the Italian market. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so yes, it is a type of virtual reality. Do you consider it in training? Yeah, you have to we, you use what you have in your clinic. Um, Marusa Pavlo, who we've mentioned a lot of articles, she has a couple of really, really pivotal Keystone articles. Um, she has a lot of articles that talk about the differences and the benefits of using uh, a computer screen versus a, a big screen TV versus head mounted display. Right now, I think the, the jury is still out what is better than one or the other. And it also really will depend on that's the hardware. It also would really depend on exactly what your environment that you're showing. What is the software that you're using? Um, I don't know if this topic is, uh, so virtual reality will be presented at ICBR. There's uh, a lot of researchers in, in the field of virtual reality are presenting on different areas. Uh, not specifically about this, but Helena, I'm going to say if you can get in contact with Dr. Pavlo, she would be a great journal club. Yes, uh, I have a lengthy yeah. list of people I want to get a hold who of. Knows, who knows her? I, can get I've been it. shying away from the internationals because I'm like, oh, like, how am I going to do the timing? Yeah, so right. maybe I'll just not worry about doing it live for those um, for 2023. I, I we'll would see. vote for that. I would vote for <laughs> She's hard to get in, in, in contact with, but uh, I think she is the lady that has all the answers that people, or maybe doesn't have all the answers. She has she's a lot of answers. The, she's doing the research that can help us answer a lot of the questions. But yeah, Robin, that's a great question. For sure. I don't know if it's related to the ICBR, but you'll be there. Come meet us. For sure. Thank you, Robin. And um, I think we're just about out of time, but I just had one burning question. If you have some patient, I just had a patient today. She has partial bilateral loss, I'll call it. So she still has some dizziness. She still has some, you know, symptoms. She definitely, um, even though I did not do a rotary chair test on her or anything, I'm pretty sure she has some, some, you know, preservation on one or both sides. Um, but it's from chemo. So, you know, bilateral damage makes yeah, sense for her and she definitely yeah, positive bilateral head thrust test, et cetera. Um, my vibration induces staying once I get a beat to one side. So I have a sense of which side's the stronger stride for whatever that's worth. Um, she also has peripheral neuropathy in her feet. So any specific thoughts on, you know, for somebody who has more, what we'll call somatosensory impairments, um, can you still use virtual reality safely? How would you want to progress that patient? Just like two thoughts on that, and then we'll wrap this sucker up. Oh, there's, there's not enough time to even give two <laughs> thoughts on that. Um, yeah, generally, balance is not just sensory, but it's motor. So when we're talking about using virtual reality, we're focusing on the sensory system, primarily the visual system, whether we're training someone to use it or training someone to avoid it. So virtual reality would be great because we want to train this woman who has decreased or no somatosensory, decreased or no vestibular to upweight her visual system. So we do want to actually train her visually. Virtual reality would be great for that. On the flip side, we need to train this woman's motor systems and make her more mobile, more flexible, move around more. And virtual reality can also help to do that, right? You can do squatting and standing, uh, dynamic stepping and walking and shifting that can work on core strengthening uh, and the head turning and the arm reaching, all of that type, um, all of those types of things will be beneficial for someone like that. But of course, you use your clinical judgment. Maybe you start seated before you do it in standing. Maybe you do seated with uh, cuff weights at the wrist to increase her upper body strength, increase her core strength, increase her cardiovascular endurance. And somatosensory uh, input. I love using weights for that. Yeah, That's and a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, right. So her brain is processing. Somatosensory is the biggest sensory system in the body. Our skin, our proprioception, our mechanoreceptors, all of those things are really um, so critical when we talk about retraining, sensory reweighting, right? We do need to, to train people not just to use their feet, but the rest of their body and especially the neck. The neck is the next big, uh, the next big thing we'll be talking about. But again, virtual reality, if you're turning your head, you're turning your neck, you're strengthening, um, could be very beneficial for her, but think of those clinical pearls. Uh, the quantification of a baseline for her may not be based on her symptoms, but it would be based on her balance. How good is her static? static dynamic 
uh, what types of balance activities are better for her or more challenging for her, dose her to tolerance. Make sure she's starting safe and simple and slow and then progress her. Right. And I know that we all know this, but she also has, um, you know, we have, we have bodies, we have orthopedic bodies, even when we have a vestibular issue. So she happens to be dealing with a labral issue in her hip. So, you know, you're going to adjust the activities to that as well. You know, I'll be careful with my weight shifting. I'm not going to do a deep squat with her at this point. Like, you know, so we're going to kind of just think of all of those different pieces. To me, it's the fun part about um, doing rehabilitation. I think as a new clinician, I probably was highly intimidated, confused, and worried. So, you know, that's why you need mentorship uh, and all these different educational opportunities like the Journal Club. So catch us next month. Thank you so, so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank everyone else for joining us as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you in August to discuss that lovely topic of persistent postural perceptual dizziness once more. So, It'll be a great one. <laughs> it will. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night.